Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today is twice the value, with two tasty bus topics packed into one episode. That's because I'll begin with a classic Microsoft interview question about school buses, and then we'll tour the various computer buses from ISA to PCI Express. I'll give you all the details on how they actually work, how they differ, and then we'll benchmark and we'll chart their performance relative to one another. The results are actually pretty surprising. So first, we'll talk about the interview bus, and then we'll talk about ISA, ESA, Visa, PCI, and especially Microchannel. I was actually busy writing this episode on the PC data bus when that suddenly reminded me of an old interview question about buses at Microsoft. The person I know that received this question during the interview loop was actually interviewing for a finance job, so I guess this is a finance question from the mid-90s. In any event, here it is. This is a picture of a bus. It's totally symmetrical. In which direction is the bus going? Now, when initially presented to me, my first answer was down because there's no ground or surface portrayed, so to me, the only option was that the bus was falling. That's apparently not the correct answer, so I guess I'd be a no higher in finance. There actually is a good answer, and it's one that will annoy you if you don't get it in advance. So go ahead and think about it for a while, and I'll give you the answer later in the episode. Because now, it's my time to revisit my latest eBay score, something you've likely not seen in a long time, if ever. A real IBM PS2 system with an actual microchannel bus and microchannel cards inside. That means I was eager to tell you all about IBM's big bet on microchannel and what was so cool about it, but that, in turn, meant that I first had to brush up on all the details about MCA, ISA, ESA, Visa, PCI, and so on myself. Despite the fact that I worked on MS-DOS itself, it's been a while, and even I still had to refresh my memory on the IRQs and IO ranges and the differences between the major computer buses and how things like DMA and burst mode and bus mastering all work. Those are terms that everyone hears and even throws about all the time because they're truly essential to desktop computing. But do you really know what you're talking about or are maybe some of the details a little fuzzy? Well, in about 12 minutes, they're going to be nice and crisp. So just what the heck is microchannel and why on earth did I buy this IBM PS2 Model 55 SX? Well, microchannel was an IBM bus standard for slots and expansion cards, but its real reason for existing was to address the significant shortcomings of the original PC bus, known later as the ISA bus. Microchannel debuted in their new line of computers known as the IBM Personal System 2 or PS2. Now, I'm probably one of the few people that's actually nostalgic about IBM's PS2 microchannel lineup, and that's because in college, I worked part-time for IBM up in Canada, building and setting up PS2 systems for their direct-to-end-user sales. The customer would order a PS2 model 30, 50, or 70, and I, or one of the full-time techs, like Mr. Benoit, would build the order to suit. That meant installing the hard drive and the adapter cards, as well as formatting and partitioning, setting up MS-DOS, Windows, and any applications that they had purchased. Now, done right, the techs could hurry and build three to four fully configured machines per day, but that still seemed awfully slow to me. So in a bout of laziness that was fortunately seen as ambition by most everyone else, I built a setup where I had imaged the hard drives of all the various configurations that we actually sold. One might have MS-DOS and Lotus, and another one WordPerfect, but by the end of the week, I had a portfolio of most every combination ready to go. Now, this was before Ethernet was common on PCs, and these machines usually had no networking for the home anyway, so I used a program called Laplink and a parallel cable to flash the appropriate image onto the machines in just minutes. The techs could literally just park their hardware in front of my main server machine, connect the cable, pick from the menu, and the rest was actually automated. Simply copying the installation images down to the hard drive was many times faster than manually installing every piece of the software. Now, the most systems anyone had built in one day had been five. On the first full Saturday, I did 18 by myself, which turns out to be mostly a lot of boxing and unboxing of PCs, and so I'm not even sure that Mr. Benoit enjoyed the new pace of his job either. Soon, production had soared about fivefold, and not long after that, I was out of a job because they no longer needed the additional part-time techs such as myself. I tried pretty desperately to get myself a programming job there based on that, but the local union wouldn't allow skip levels, and so, yada yada yada, I wound up over at Microsoft instead. I guess as the old book says, no programmer is accepted in his hometown. Let's get back to the story of Microchannel itself. To understand the importance of Microchannel, you need to know what brought it about and what it was replacing, the original IBM PC bus. And for completeness, what precisely is a bus? Well. It's the part of the system that exposes the slots in your motherboard so that you can plug expansion cards into it. 
When you plug in such a card, it needs a way to talk to the CPU and memory and interact with the address space. It does that by plugging into and connecting to the dozens of lines or pins that the bus exposes in the slot. Every expandable computer typically has a bus. Even the venerable Commodore 64 exposed its bus on the back of the machine with a single expansion slot. But the oldest and simplest bus that we actually care about for today is the original IBM PC bus, and that was even before it was called ISA. That 8-bit bus was used back in the bad old days of the PC and XT. On the AT and forward, it grew to become a 16-bit bus, then known as the ISA bus for industry standard architecture. Just like today's modern PC buses, the ISA bus slots on the motherboard were a way for a card to access the address, data, and control lines of the CPU. Each card would declare an I.O. address range that the CPU could use to communicate with the card, as well as reserve any of the IRQ signals that the card intended to use. Because there is a set of address lines and an 8-bit set of data lines, an adapter card can actually write to address in any base memory simply by setting the right address lines to the data bits and commanding a memory write. That approach works fine for small bits of data. Let's say you have a clock card and all it did was give you an accurate time of day. To make use of it, the software on the PC, known as its device driver, might command the card to store the current time in a set of bytes in memory. And then the card would do so and you'd have the time of day. The problem is that the CPU had to wait on the card for many clock cycles while it was busy poking those bytes somewhere into system memory. A better approach is DMA or direct memory access. That allows the expansion card and the CPU to effectively work in parallel. Let's say the CPU wants the floppy controller card to read a sector into a memory buffer at a particular address. Rather than fetching each byte one by one from the card and poking it into memory one at a time, the driver would send the floppy controller card the base address of the buffer in memory, the size, and the info on which sector to read. Once it gave it the go-ahead command, the floppy could proceed at its own pace to load the bytes from disk and stick them into memory, and the CPU can go about doing other work in the meantime while the controller fills up that buffer. Of course, the CPU can't really make use of the results from the floppy until they're ready, but how can it know when it is? Well, it could pull the card by asking, hey, are you done with that last operation yet? Every so often, but a more practical approach is to raise what is known as an interrupt request. You've no doubt heard of interrupts and IRQs, but unless you're actually a programmer, you might not know what they do. An IRQ, or an interrupt request, is the card's way of saying, uh, excuse me, CPU, I'm done with the results, please stop whatever you're doing right now and take them off my hands immediately. It actually alerts the CPU by bringing one of the IRQ lines on the bus active, and as soon as the CPU services that interrupt request, both the CPU and the floppy are then free to proceed with other work. There are 16 IRQ lines available and most are already in use by the operating system to communicate with devices like floppy controllers, hard disk controllers, printers, COM ports, all of which are assigned IRQ numbers based on a convention. For example, all keyboard controllers used IRQ1, and so IRQ1 was never available for use by other devices. Each card that did need an interrupt was usually assigned one by the system builder. In the old days, that meant you, and in the MS-DOS days, it specifically meant that you had to edit your config.sys file and tell the drivers that you were loading there what the I.O. and IRQ resources that they were being allocated were. IRQs cannot generally be shared between devices. As noted, most were already in use by the system in some way, but if you knew that the second printer port was assigned IRQ5, but that you didn't have a second printer port in your machine, then you were fine to reassign that IRQ to something like a Sound Blaster card. And that's why Sound Blasters can usually be configured to use either IRQ5 or IRQ7, both of which overlap with printer ports 1 and 2, and so if you wanted two printer ports and a sound card, it seems like you're out of luck unless somebody made one that used different interrupt lines altogether. Sometimes there would be jumpers or dip switches on the devices to allow you to use different resources so as not to collide with something that you already had, but not always. And this is the kind of the nonsense that people had to put up with before DLL Hill. Most pieces of hardware, expansion cards included, need a device driver. A device driver is merely the piece of software, usually made by the same vendor as the device itself, that runs on the PC side to talk to the card. The driver and the card are made to work together, and the driver therefore needs a way to send information to the card and vice versa. So in one paragraph, here's how the whole thing works. So you load a device driver in config.sys, and the CPU executes code in the device driver which communicates info to the card by using I.O. instructions to write to the memory mapped addresses that the card manufacturer specified. Perhaps 0330 is the address that the card uses. 
When it has results ready for the PC, it raises an interrupt to let it know, and it may then send those results over a DMA channel. That's about it. The original bus has only four DMA channels. DMA can flow in both directions, because after all, if the PC wants to play a digital audio sample, all it really needs to do is to place the audio data in memory somewhere, send that address to the sound card, and tell the sound card to play the sample from memory. The card can then run around in the background playing digital music and effects with pretty much no help from the CPU other than to refill the buffers as needed periodically. Note that the original IBM PC bus was only 8 bits wide. Its interface with memory means that it can write to any address up to the full megabyte, but it can only transfer one byte in either direction at a time, once per clock. When the PCAT came along with a 16-bit CPU, they had to expand the bus by adding the additional 8 data bits, for a total of 16 bits. And so without changing anything else about the clock speed, suddenly the bandwidth had doubled and it could now load or store twice as much data per cycle. This ISA bus standard, while antiquated now, has been adapted to many other uses as well. For example, ATA hard drive cables are really not much more than a subset of the ISA bus. It has all the same 16 data bits, one IRQ line, one DMA line, and three address bits. Unlike the ISA bus, however, the ATA bus would negotiate bus speeds between the host and the devices, which allows it to optimize its bus frequency. Though less common in the PC world, there was also an XT-IDE version of that standard that supported only 8 bits at a time. And as I said, it wasn't very popular on the PC, but the standard was used extensively in the Amiga line with devices such as the A590 hard disk. So if you had one of those, you also had a little PC bus in your Amiga without ever knowing it. The clock rate increased over time, though. In the original IBM PC, the bus ran synchronous with the CPU, meaning that it ran at 4.77 MHz. Later clones would try to go as high as 20 MHz, but the standard speed on the AT bus was limited to 8 MHz. If you put in a 10 MHz AT CPU, in some cases, but not all, adapter cards of the day could tolerate it or not, depending on what your luck was like that day. That could be pushed to 10 MHz in some cases, but not all adapter cards of the day could tolerate it. Strapping a 10 MHz 286 into your AT was a big deal, and it was just too much power for some of the more marginal cards, I guess. The ISA bus also supported some limited bus mastering. This is the process by which we saw the controller card take over and read and write memory on its own using DMA. Without bus mastering, the expansion cards would be dependent on some kind of external bus mastering controller, or worse, CPU control, but with bus mastering, the cards can do it themselves. They simply take over the bus and do their transfer. What if two cards both want to access at the same time and both try to be master of the bus domain at the same time? Well, there needs to be some kind of priority arbitration between them. For example, with the SCSI hard drive bus standard, the lowest drive IDs go first. I could not actually locate an actual standard for the arbitration on the PC bus, and it seems to be up to the motherboard manufacturer. I guess whatever the IBM PC did pretty much is the de facto standard. One thing that the ISA bus did not support was burst mode. Rather than repeating a list of addresses and values, burst mode declares a starting point in memory and a length. Then it reads or writes those bytes in sequence without resending any of the address info. But ISA has no concept of burst mode. You set up each transfer as normal and are expected to handle exactly one data byte per clock. As systems look to grow to 32 bits, the race was on not only to expand the data size of the bus again, but also its addressing capability. Well, the original XT bus actually supported 19 bits of addressing, that was still only enough to access the lowest megabyte of memory. This grew with a 16-bit bus to 24 address bits, meaning it could access the lowest 16 megabytes of memory, but nothing beyond that. And so as systems grew, a 32-bit bus would soon be needed not only for the 30 bits of data, but also to access the 32-bit address space. Improvements would also be needed in bus mastering, arbitration, and other features. One of the thorns in IBM's side since the introduction of the original IBM PC was how easily its hardware was cloned. You often hear that the problem was it was built from off-the-shelf parts, but it's more subtle than that. The actual problem was that those shelves weren't special IBM shelves. They were the same electronics parts shelves that all the computer manufacturers shopped at. Anything that IBM put into their PC, Compaq and Gateway could pick up easily for themselves. And once they had the BIOS, they could effectively run unlimited copies of both hardware and software. So here's a bit of trivia for your next cocktail party. Most people believe that the ISA bus goes back to the original PC, in 8-bit form anyway, but it actually goes back, even before that, to the IBM System 23 Data Master, which never really took off. The whole IBM bus had actually been shipped a month before the PC. 
The card slots themselves are even just edge connectors, and they're certainly not unique to IBM. The only way IBM could protect itself was on the trademark on the system BIOS, but once Compaq and others had managed to duplicate the IBM BIOS's functionality without actually copying it, almost nothing stood in the way of building a fully compatible clone. And thanks to Bill Gates's rather legendary shrewdness in maintaining non-exclusivity on the MS-DOS license, clone manufacturers could then load their systems with a fully compatible operating system as well, MS-DOS. IBM tried to right the situation more to their favor by making the next line of computers, the forthcoming PS2 line, faster, better, stronger, and much more proprietary. To that end, they began development of the OS2 operating system and engineering on a new 32-bit system known as Microchannel. Anyone would be able to use IBM's microchannel interface in card design, but they would have to pay a royalty to IBM for each expansion card that was produced to use it. In his LGR episode on the IBM PS2 Model 90, IBM's plan was to effectively disinvite everyone else from the 32-bit party by making the new bus proprietary to IBM alone. Even though the base clock speed only increased from 8 MHz in the PC-80 to 10 MHz in the PS2, the bus was now twice as wide and it supported dedicated bus controller logic that enabled burst mode, which at the end of the day meant that microchannel was about five times as fast as the ISA bus. At the same time, a PC clone consortium known as the Gang of Nine, led by Compaq, set out to create a new open bus standard that the clone systems could use that would feature most of the improvements of microchannel. Though not directly equivalent, the two bus standards were largely competitive. The ESA bus was largely desirable in that it was free to use and backwards compatible with the 16-bit ISA bus. The card slots were longer but still incorporated the connectors of the 16-bit version so that older cards could still be used. The Gang of Nine was wagering that even though ESA ran at 8 MHz, the backwards compatibility of ESA would win out over the 10 MHz speed of Microchannel. By the way, Microchannel was later up to 20 MHz but apparently only in the RISC RS6000 machines and not in the Intel x86 lineup. One thing I find cool is that the updated bus mastering of both systems allowed cards to talk directly from one to another without CPU intervention. Each added unique arbitration schemes in order to arbitrate the multi-master environment. In theory, this multi-master support is not unlike that found in most mainframes. IBM offered to license microchannel to other PC makers for between 1 and 5% of the machine price. There were few takers, though. Dell, NCR, and Tandy offered a few systems with it, but did not move their entire PC lineup to it. Tandy president John Roche said at the time he was making the machine only to supply the demand, the existence of which surprised him. When it came to their microchannel offering called the 5000MC, he said he was surprised anybody would want it at all. But apparently a few did. The bandwidth of the various bus models are revealing. While the IBM PC at 4.77 could only support about 4 megabytes a second, that grew all the way to 16 megabytes a second, half duplex. Microchannel brought that up to 40 megabytes a second. Within a few years, however, the PCI bus standard would appear. PCI stands for Peripheral Connect Interface, and though the connector is smaller, because the pins are tiny, it's double the bit width at 64 bits. When run at 66 MHz, that bus is capable of 533 MB a second. In today's machines, you're most likely to find PCI E slots for Peripheral Connect Interface Express. Now, it's a bit too complex to fully explain in the time remaining in this episode, so if you want to learn more about it, make sure you're subscribed, because for now, I'm just going to wow you with the performance specs. The beautiful thing about bus performance is that for at least the last 20 years, it's been doubling effectively every three years, sometimes even faster than that. The PCIe bus began in 2002 at 8 gigabytes a second. By 2010, with a full X16 link, the PCIe bus had grown to 8 GHz for PCI 3, and that would bring about a maximum of 32 GB per second of bandwidth today. If you're lucky to have the PCI 4 bus, that actually goes up to 16 GHz, and the bandwidth grows to 64 GB a second. And when PCI 5 is widely available, it will double that frequency again to 32 GHz for a total bandwidth of 128 GB a second. PCI 6 is in spec now, and doubles it again for a mass of 256 gigabytes per second. It's not merely that such advances move ahead the maximum throughput of an X16 link, but because the frequency doublings affect all of the PCIe slots, not just the 16 slots, that means that the high-speed network card that might have required a large and complex X16 interface can now achieve the required bandwidth in only a 4X slot. If along the way you found today's episode to be any combination of entertaining or informative, I'd be honored if you would consider subscribing to my channel.
If I see new subs for a topic like this, then I know it's growing an interest in the channel, so your subscription not only helps grow the channel, it helps mold future content as well. And if you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. And finally, the answer to the bus question. The answer is that the bus is going left. Why? Well, here's the big hint. The opposite answer would be true in England. Still not seeing it? Well, a bus drawn at this level of detail would show the side door just like it shows the windows, but there isn't a side door. So the door must be on the far side of the bus, meaning that the left side of the picture is the front of the bus, and thus it's traveling left. Love it? Hate it? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Remember, I'm just in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Do it, Lynn! Do it, do it!